Robin, there are some ABCs to get straight first if we're to understand what's happening in the Horn of Africa, and A is simply where it is. It's this portion of the African continent where the Indian Ocean and the Straits into the Red Sea come together on the northeast coastal corner of Africa. It's made up of the nations of Somalia, Ethiopia, and portions of Sudan and Kenya down here, as well as the small and independent state of Djibouti, which is located right there. Now, as Robin said, there are two areas of warfare in the Horn going on right now. One is in the Eritrea area of Ethiopia, along the coast of the Red Sea. Now, this is where Eritrean guerrilla forces are fighting Ethiopian troops in the cause of Eritrean independence. Then over here, there's the bigger conflict in the Agadan region of Ethiopia between Ethiopia and Somalia. And latest reports have the Somalias occupying most of this entire Agadan region. Robin? The present Somali nation was created in 1960 by merging two former colonies, Italian Somalia and British Somaliland. That left large numbers of Muslim Somali tribesmen living in Christian Ethiopia and Kenya. That set off a Somali drive to expand the borders to what they considered the real or greater Somalia. The current Somali advance into Ethiopia is part of that drive. The United States was friendly to Somalia, but cut off aid in 1971 because the Somalis were trading with North Vietnam. The Russians stepped in and supplied arms and military training. In return, the Soviets got the use of the Red Sea port, Berbera, which they began to develop for the use of the growing Soviet Navy. Then last summer, the Somalis used their strong Soviet-trained army to support an attack on Ethiopia. But what the Somalis found was that the Soviets were also helping the Ethiopians with military aid. The Somalis felt double-crossed and kicked the Soviets out of the country and out of the port of Berbera. Then the Somalis asked Washington for aid. So far, they haven't got it. The Somali ambassador to the United Nations is Abdirazak Haji Hussein, a former prime minister of Somalia. Mr. Ambassador, what is the military situation now? Are we correct in saying, as Jim Des did, that... Somali forces are far inside the Ogaden. It's not correct that the Somali regular forces are far inside the disputed area. Not regular forces? Not regular forces. What are there is the forces, the ind indigenous liberation movement of the territory. Of course, the Somali Democratic Republic is, as we said several times, and I would like to repeat it again here, is that we are supporting morally and materially this liberation movement of the territory, which we believe it is in keeping with the general principle of the United Nations Charter as well as the Organization of African, Youth, uh, African Unity Charter. Um, we have another map. Uh, have you got the other map that um, that shows the um, close-up here of the of the um, corner? Roughly, how far inside this are these indigenous forces and the uh, and your troops who are supporting them? Well, the uh, liberation movements, according to information available to us so far, is uh, almost on the verge of the city of Harar. Uh, and uh, they have already succeeded in liberating the major part of the territory, of their territory. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, if it were not because on, of the intervention, military intervention on the part of the Soviet Union, by now they would have been able to regain their complete uh, and total victory. Which you consider the part of great, greater Somalia, the real Somalia, which exists inside Ethi the present Ethiopia. Well, you know, we have never, this word greater Somalia has never been a child of Somalia. Uh, what we have said in the state right from the beginning uh, was and still is the right of the Somali Union, Somali people to be reunited. I see. 
Do you expect, because of the Soviet aid and the buildup of that aid to Ethiopia, which you've just referred to, does your country expect an Ethiopian counterattack now on your country? Of course, we are expecting and we have alerted the world and warned uh, from the mouth of my president uh, uh, about two weeks ago that according to information available to us, this kind of invasion against Somalia could be expected any moment from now. Have you, um, is your request for American aid still in, in Washington? Is well, it still outstanding? Have you it, renewed it? As far as we are concerned, yes, it is still outstanding. And what answer have you got so far? Well, so far we did not have any uh, uh, definite answer, but we hear through the news media that the uh, United States of America is still reluctant, reluctant to, to give. return on its original decision. I see. When you, to put it crudely, asked the Soviet forces to leave, did you do so with, an un with any understanding that there would be American aid? Not at all. You did not? No, we didn't. But you believe that you were promised American aid um, up last summer, I believe. Is that correct? I wouldn't say so. The only thing we have had was that there was uh, a promise that defensive military assistance will be given to Somalia. There was no time limit and there was no other conditions. From this administration? From no. this administration. I see. From this administration. And I, as a matter of fact, it had been uh, publicized that the United States uh, government is quite willing to give Somalia uh, military assistance for defensive purposes. I have one more but question. This was not the basis of our, uh, not our, we have never had any, this was not the basis of, uh, for example, of uh, expelling the Soviet Union from Somalia. Uh, it has nothing to do. They were two completely different and separate things. All right, we'll come back to this. Thank you. Jim? All right, now to the situation as far as Ethiopia is concerned. The irony of, all, of it all is that, that from the end of World War II until 1974, Ethiopia was one of the United States' staunchest allies in Africa. There was a close relationship with the well-known Ethiopia leader, Haile Selassie, the Lion of Judah, as he called himself. During Selassie's reign, half of all U.S. foreign aid to Africa went to Ethiopia. But Selassie was deposed in 1974, and an army-led coup established a Marxist-oriented government. The new government became friendly with the Soviet Union and increasingly hostile toward the United States. Last April, the United States stopped all military aid to Ethiopia. Most U.S. officials were then forced to leave the country. The ties to the Soviet Union were thus strengthened. Soviet weapons and military advisors, along with Cubans, came to Ethiopia. And this support was stepped up considerably after the Ethiopians found themselves on the losing end, both in Eritrea and in the Agadan region against Somalia. There's some dispute about it, but the best intelligence sources estimate that there are some 3,000 Soviet and Cuban military advisors now in Ethiopia. The word is, as the ambassador just said, that the Ethiopian plan is to soon launch a major counteroffensive to win back Agadan. Today, the leader of the Ethiopian government accused President Carter of coordinating an international plot to arm Somalia and put the Horn of Africa under anti-Ethiopian forces. Well, Congressman Don Bonker, Democrat from the state of Washington, just returned from a fact-finding tour of the Horn of Africa. He and Congressman Paul Songus met with Ethiopian leaders. Both are members of the House International Affairs Committee, and their written report on their trip says the potential for violence and instability and is great in the Horn of Africa. They gave that same message to President Carter last week at a White House meeting. Congressman, first, what is the basic Ethiopian view of the fighting in the Agadan region against Somalia? Well, the Ethiopians view this with understandable alarm because it represents the possible dismemberment of their nation. They feel that the Somalis invaded in the Agadan uh, these are internationally recognized borders, and in 1964, the OAU indeed recognized all of the borders uh, in Africa. So when the Somalis attacked, they could only do what would be expected of any nation, and that's move to protect their own territory. They don't see it as an indige in indigenous uh, move for uh, independence, as the ambassador just portrayed it. Well, that's one of the problems, Jim, with all of the areas of Africa. There are Somali inhabitants in that area. 
and, uh, but it happens to be inside Ethiopia. And I just don't believe that, uh, that the Ethiopians are going to allow their uh, country to be carved up. Now, one can say that while all of the African leaders support fully uh, Ethiopia's case uh, in, in the conflict over the Ogaden, there is understandable concern over uh, Russian motives and intentions in that area and the supply of such uh, massive amounts of uh, Soviet equipment to the Ethiopians. All right, now that brings me to my next question, Congressman, about Ethiopia. The Somalians have charged in the past and others have suggested that Ethiopia is now, to put it bluntly, under the thumb of the Soviet Union. Did you find that to be the case when you were there? I think one could make a good case for that, uh, not only with the uh, massive uh, supplies that we saw uh, actually when we were in Ethiopia, in fact, we were delayed two days because of a disabled uh, Soviet airplane on the runway. Uh, we also understand that there has been a new commission established that's representative of the Ethiopians, the Russians, and the Cubans. And the Russians and Cubans outnumber the Ethiopians. So I think that they will continue to uh, assert uh, influence and growing influence over military and political decisions in that country. All right. Military decisions. Uh, the ambassador said, and I said also a moment ago, and it's been well reported, that the Ethiopians are planning a counterattack in that Agadan region to get that land back. Uh, there's no question in, my, in your mind, is there, that that's going to happen? I think that's going to happen, but I think one must look carefully at the map. It's almost militarily impossible to clear the entire area of the Somalis, so they'll probably concentrate their attack in the north, uh, in uh, Harar and possibly move beyond the Somali border to capture Hargeisia and possibly Berbera. Uh, that would be for uh, strategic reasons, because um, if they can uh, succeed in doing that, then perhaps they can negotiate with the Somalis to have them clear out the entire Ogaden region. Mm -hmm. But middle, militarily, it's impossible to, uh, to take a, a total front and succeed in that area. Well, it's not... The, the crucial question here is if, assuming there is a counterattack and assuming that the Ethiopians have been well supplied with uh, Russian arms and, uh, and other kinds of support and assuming that they can whip the Somalians in that area, mm -hmm. it doesn't then the question become whether or not they will in fact stop at their own border. I mean, for instance, if they, if they are able to one way or another get this land, this particular, the Ag this is the Agaden region, if they're able to get that back and maintain, regain control of it, then the question is, are they going to continue going into Somalia and are we going to have a real war on our hands? You talked to the Ethiopian yes. leaders about that. What did they tell you? Well, we asked Colonel Mengustu, who's head of the DIRD. Um, and the DIRD is the ruling, ruling body of, uh, of Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Right. That's correct. And he said that uh, he had no intention of moving beyond the border. He also said that uh, he didn't want to make the same mistakes that the Somalis made. And we also met with the Russian same ambassador. Same mistake to Somalia. What do you mean by, by that? By invading uh, by, another country. By coming in there in the first place. Yeah. Right. And we also asked that of the Russian ambassador to Ethiopia, and he said he would not, his country would not sponsor such an initiative. But again, uh, I think that's the only way that the Ethiopians are going to regain their entire area. And should they move beyond that line, then that adds a new dimension to the conflict, and it'll quickly spread not only throughout northern Africa, but the Middle East as well. Do you think there's every likelihood that that's going to happen? I think there's a good possibility it will happen. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Congressman. Robin? The confrontation in the Horn of Africa takes on a certain global significance, not because of what the Horn is, but where it is. The Horn divides the Red Sea from the Indian Ocean, and analysts say it's of substantial importance to the Soviet Union. The former Russian naval base at Berbera, Somalia, was used to monitor oil tanker traffic in the Red Sea. The base also gave the Soviets their only base on the Indian Ocean, a region of growing importance to the Russians. The ocean off the Somali coast is considered a prime fishing ground. The Soviets, when they were on friendly terms with the Somalis, made clear their intention to increase their trawler fleets in the region. In 1963, Tom Farrer went to Somalia to help train their police force. He's now a professor of law at Rutgers University, but he maintains his interest in the region and is the author of the book War Clouds on the Horn of Africa, A Crisis for Detente. Mr. Farrer, how do you explain the Soviets' changing sides in this case? In the first place, Robin, I don't think they wanted to change sides. Rather, they wanted to do in the Horn what we've been trying to do in the Middle East. That is, to play honest broker between both of the antagonists and to increase their influence accordingly. I guess the real question is why, after they failed in a fairly creative piece of diplomacy, that is, the proposal 
spearheaded by the appearance of Fidel Castro in the region to try to arrange a sort of Marxist federation. After that failed, then why did they begin to tilt farther and farther towards Ethiopia? And I think there are a number of reasons, and you have to do the same kind of cost-benefit analysis that you can imagine a Soviet strategist doing. Uh, you have to consider what were they likely to give up and what were they likely to gain. Now, it's ironic that most people strongly emphasize the importance of the, this naval base on the Indian Ocean, that is Berbera. And yet, if it were so objectively important to the Soviet Union, isn't it a bit odd that the Soviet Union should have been prepared to risk expulsion? Indeed, after a certain point, expulsion was, it seems to me, certain. That seems to suggest that there's been a good deal of alarmist comment on the significance of this base. My own view is that Berbera was never a major base, never had great strategic value, and still doesn't have great strategic value. Well, well, let me put it this way. Does Ethiopia, which without these coastal areas of either Eritrea or Somalia is landlocked, does Ethiopia make any sense for the Soviet Union, given its increasing and rising naval power, if it does not have a port? Ethiopia makes sense as the African or the Horn of Africa alive for the Soviet Union if there's a fair chance that with Soviet and Cuban aid, Ethiopia can win. That is, it can defeat Somalia, even if, even if it doesn't occupy the coastal regions, it can still defeat Somalia and then turn its attention to the insurgency, the rebellion in Eritrea, and gradually reclaim the Eritrean coast, which is the present, at the present time is virtually in Eritrean hands. And I think the Soviet calculation was that with their assistance, the Somali attack could be blunted. And part of that calculation, of course, rests on the assumption that the U.S. would not provide significant support to Somalia. What is the American strategic interest in the Horn of Africa? I think our strategic interest in the Horn of Africa is objectively very modest. But the danger is that if enough people are convinced that the Horn of Africa is strategically significant, then, as Congressman Bonker said, there is a danger of more and more countries being drawn in. Although. I cannot believe that there would be a major escalation of the conflict geographically into the Middle East. That seems to me extremely unlikely. But the real danger is that is the constant reiteration, as even in your opening remarks, that this is an area of great strategic significance. I think that that case is yet to be made by the congressman or by anybody else. Uh, how do you explain, you mentioned the Middle East, how do you exchange, explain the rather strange bedfellows there are in this relationship? As I understand it, you have the Ethiopians with allies in the Soviet Union and Israel, and the Somalians with allies in um, presumably Egypt, the Sudan, Saudi Arabia perhaps. How do you explain that, looking at it objectively? First of all, there's the old Middle East saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Of course, this is very complicated for Israel, since although Ethiopia is seen, as, is seen, at least historically, as the enemy of the Arab states, at the same time the Soviet Union is seen as the enemy of Israel in the Middle East. So it makes, it makes the Israeli decision a very conflicted one. One of the things you have to consider, I think, is that Israel was in Ethiopia for a long period of time as a major source of technical assistance and military training. And there are a certain number of Israeli strategists who were there during that period who have a sympathy for the Ethiopian situation, who feel that in the longer term, the Ethiopians are a fairly stable ally of the Israelis simply because of the historical enmity between Arabs and Ethiopia. I see. Rob. Thank you. Jim? Yes, gentlemen, let's talk for a few moments about uh, peace rather than war. And let me begin with you, Ambassador, uh, bouncing off something that Congressman uh, Bonkers said that if Ethiopia, assuming there's the counterattack, lay out the scenario I did a moment ago, assuming there is a counterattack and with the help of Soviet weapons, etc., that uh, Ethiopia is, is able to win back the Agadan and occupy it, would Somalia then say, okay, forget it, the war is over, or do you think there could be a continued war, or well, that would just merely escalate it? Mr. Ambassador, did you understand the question? No, I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't understand. I, I don't think you understood the question, Jim. You weren't. Well, that, it was probably too long and uh, complex. Probably my fault, Mr. Ambassador. Let me try again. If if Ethiopia does win the Agadan back, as they seem determined to do with the help of the Soviets, would that end it as far as Somalia is concerned, or would you, in fact, try to get together a counterattack? Would that merely escalate the war, or do you think it then would be possible to sit down and resolve the dispute? 
Well, I in this, if I understood it very well, because uh, unfortunately I don't hear very well, uh, and but if I understood the question put to me, uh, <clears throat> it said that if the Ethiopians recaptured the Ogaden and uh, would not encroach the uh, border known as the Somali Democratic Republic, uh, would that be acceptable to the Somali Republic? Is that the, the question? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, in the first place, uh, uh, we must first of all establish that this war which is going on in the area is a war of liberation. Uh, it is up to the inhabitants of that area to decide uh, whether uh, they would accept any condition. We in the Somali Democratic Republic, we think that anything short of the right of self-determination uh, and independence of that people will be unacceptable to the people of the area. It may take a long time. These people might have set back, as had been also the case in the past, but I don't think they will ever renounce this legitimate right to self-determination and independence. Congressman, that, that doesn't sound very optimistic in terms of a negotiated settlement. Is that, is that your reading of the situation too, plus put together now with what the ambassador says? I think it's going to be very difficult to um, negotiate a settlement over the Ogaden. It's not merely uh, military adventurism by either country. It's something that's felt deeply at the grassroots level. Many of the present Somali leaders come from the Ogaden. And they have uh, tribal links uh, and um, a very deep-rooted compassion for the people who reside in that area. Ethiopia, for her part, is totally committed to the territorial integrity that's uh, now recognized by all international organizations. So uh, I just don't believe there's going to be a short or um, uh, uh, long-lasting peaceful settlement to the Ogaden. It may have going to take be, a military solution? It may have to take a military standoff. All right, Robin? Yes, let's discuss, for the time we have left, what the United States should actually do. Mr. Ambassador, you have asked the United States and the Carter administration for military aid to prevent the Soviet-backed Ethiopians doing what Jim's just been describing. Um, Congressman Bonker, you said in your report um, to the president, at least the report that I read when you came back, that you felt a laissez-faire attitude by the United States was untenable. What is not untenable? What do you want the United States to do? Well, I believe that the administration should pursue a course of uh, neutrality, total neutrality, uh, in the Ogaden, and not side with either of the uh, disputing states. But that's under the present set of circumstances. I think we should also make it very clear that should uh, Ethiopia advance beyond the line, beyond uh, the Somali-Ethiopia border, then that adds a new dimension. And uh, we should be prepared uh, to meet that test uh, quickly when it occurs. And we should also make it abundantly clear uh, to the Soviets that um, while we are, will not be drawn into a political or military situation as long as it's contained where it is, uh, if they do uh, sponsor such an initiative, then uh, we're going to become more actively involved. In other words, what you're suggesting is, in effect, by adopting such a policy, a warning to the Soviet Union now, if you go further than the Somali border, we could change our policy on supplying arms. Is that That's true, and uh, it's not only the United States. Uh, uh, Anwar Sadat told us in Cairo that should uh, Ethiopia move beyond the line, uh, that he was prepared to send a brigade and dispatch a, a naval ship. So um, uh, the Arab countries are also uh, uh, tremendously concerned about what's happening there. Mr. Farrer, with your view of the American strategic interest being very modest, as you said, in that area, what do you think the United States should be doing? I don't think a laissez-faire policy is bad. And actually, Congressman Bonker's proposal has its attractions. But I, th I personally would favor a modest flow of military equipment to the Somali Democratic Republic if they would satisfy two conditions. One, they would have to release all political prisoners, and there are some political prisoners in the Somali Democratic Republic. Two, that, that's the sort of humani one humanitarian dimension. Two, they would have to agree to submit the dispute between themselves and Ethiopia to 
international arbitration. And the arbitration would be conducted both in accordance with law and equity, taking into account the interests of the indigenous people. We only have a moment left. Would those conditions be um, uh, insurmountable for the Somalis? Well, I don't think that as far as the Somali government is concerned, should or could decide uh, for the people of the territory. Nor do I think that the people of the territory would accept anything short to right to self-determination. Is, is this why your president said yesterday that a negotiated settlement is impossible? Well, I think when uh, my president referred this impossibility, he had in mind the, uh, the rigidity uh, with which the, the, the Ethiopians uh, have tackled this problem whenever the question of negotiation is, had been suggested by any quarter. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the military uh, action or military operation uh, will solve this problem. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Congressman. Good night, Jim. No right. Thank you, Mr. Farah. That's all for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow night. I'm Robert McNeil. Good night. For a transcript, send $1 to the McNeil Lair Report, Box 345, New York, New York, one Well, I'm bound to say that uh, all my uh, anxieties uh, about Western policy in regard to the Horn of Africa were amply confirmed. Uh, I have no hesitation in saying that we're 180 degrees on the wrong track, that the situation uh, as it exists today is that you have got the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies together with a vast number of Cuban mercenaries invading Africa and taking part in what is a purely African dispute. And uh, in consequence of this, the tiny nation of Somalia, barely three million people, is finding itself today having to face alone uh, the combined might of the Soviet Union, Cuba, and with the backing of the vast Soviet armaments industry. And to put this in some perspective, the Soviets have introduced into the area more than 400 uh, tanks, some of them of their latest model, the uh, T-62, which is approaching the armored strength of Britain's army on the Rhine, which has just over 500 chieftains. And this deployed against a tiny African country that is standing all alone. Are you then suggesting that the Western world should supply weapons and, and even troops to, um, in, in the cause of the Somalis? There's no uh, necessity whatsoever for troops. There are two ways that this could be favorably resolved. One is by the United States uh, telling the Soviet Union that it is unacceptable that she should invade Africa in this way and putting on uh, what would only require a minor demonstration of force off Cuba, which would have the Cubans running back home in double quick time. Uh, the alternative to that would be to supply uh, weapons to the Somalis. Is this, uh, as you were saying earlier, part of a, an overall grand strategy on the part of the Russians and their allies? There is no question of that. And uh, indeed, I found it fascinating talking to President Siad Barre, president of Somalia, uh, and some of his ministers in the course of the past week because they know in detail the Soviet master plan for uh, the area because not only did they have a part in it, but they were cast to play the lead role. They were going to be the base and the vehicle for uh, the imposition of a new uh, colonial control over a vast area of Africa and the Middle East. And that role is now being taken over by Ethiopia.